There's, there was so much poaching in the areas when I started here, I, and I, I had a dog, but obviously he was a Labrador, but he was a good dog, one dog, I good. So now, so now I'm walking down the field with my dog, right, uh, uh, you Bobby, and uh, his tail be up in the air, wagging away. But once I see that his tail go through between his back legs, I knew there was somebody about. Oh, was it? Yeah. And um, I remember one Sunday, I was walking down there, all the way down, with my dog, and, and then for a hundred yards before I came to his catch, his tail went between his legs, I knew. So I pulled my bitting, I, I carried a, a 12 bore a poaching gun. Uh, fold, fold it up and you can put it in a barber coat, you get me? Really? Oh yes. I, I bought a, I bought a barber, you had to, he'd protect yourself. You know I mean? Get, get him a bit rough. He'd fire it just to frighten him, wouldn't Oh, well, I'd fire over the heads, okay? You, yeah. you mean? Uh, I caught, I caught a, a bloke by here where, uh, uh, foul looking, two of them. And he said to me, if, you if, if, if I come across, he said, you and the fucking dog will be in the river, he said. <laughs> and I said, come over, mate, he said. And I fucking my gun in the air. Uh -huh. Fucking hell. Yeah? <laughs> yeah? I went fishing one evening in what was then um, water, what I would call betwixt and between, a bit high for night and a bit low for day. You know, there's a there's an in between water right. level, and um, I went fishing day fishing, and uh, it was back end of July, and uh, went day fishing, and. Uh, caught possibly 15 or 20 sewing. Nothing bigger than two pounds, but you know what I mean. In the day. In the day, yeah. And on my way down the river, because I walked quite a long way, on my way down the river, I'd seen a salmon show in this particular place called Murphy's, and I thought, I'll go back up and I'll try for that guy, right, on my way back. So I come back back up the river and because salmon will often take just, you know, just before the half light, you know? Yeah, I, yeah. And um, I knew where he was. So I walked back up and there was a chap sitting on the pool and he was a man called Lord Golding. He'd been uh, an MP and uh, in the House of Lords, very keen fisherman. So I, ha I said to John... Uh, I said, T I tell you, t there's a salmon in here. I said, why don't you have a go for it? Oh, he said, I'm set up for night fishing now. I said, fine. So I had a chat with him and I walked back up and I thought I'll fish the pool above. And I went in there and the same sort of scenario, I, I've lost a couple of fish, boom, boom, in, in the fast water in the tail. And I thought, I'm going to sort one of these out. So I put a big tandem on and I went in uh, much higher up and I hooked this fish and it was just, I know it was it back end of July, it was about 10.30. And uh, this fish, actually one of only two in my life, sea trout, took me out of the pool. And he went down into the run below and must have gone round John Golding's legs because he was in the river fishing. <laughs> because I could see him looking down. I was shouting and he couldn't hear me. And I thought, I'm going to have to cross. And, and crossing there was over your waders. Yeah. You know, it was up to, up chest to waders. Oh, yeah, yeah. Chest waders. No, no, no. Over the chest waders, right? And wow. I went across. I got a bit wet. Not In too the bad. dark. That's yeah, scary. Yeah. And then shouted again, because obviously I was closer to him, and he said, there's something going on. Anyway, we, we got the fish, and as it happened, he'd got, um, it was a hen fish, and, and it was before the days of um, digital cameras and all that, you know what I mean? It was, we're going back now, uh, 91 or 92. Um, he had a... a, a, a sort of a keep net thing which used to fish a lot for barbel this gentleman oh, yeah. and 
this thing looked like a boat. You know, it was like a way net. Looked like a the shape of a boat. Yeah, yeah. A sling. Yeah, it was a sling. So he, we put this fish into this sling and it weighed 19 pound 10. And then we put her back and she was fine. You know what I mean? She went back. Yeah. And it was very, it wasn't the end of the story actually because I then went home. And to get home I had to go under a couple of electric fences. They were that horrible height which means you can't get over them. <laughs> And yeah. and they're a bit low to get under them, you know. Yeah. You know that. So I got home, and in those days I used to put my fly boxes out to dry. Always there was a boiler, you know, in, in the in the utility room. And I got home without one of my fly boxes. So the following evening, I went back up the Dubby. I went to the keeper's house, which is up on the main roads between here and Machantlet. I went to the keeper's house, and he was the keeper. I said. You haven't by any chance got a, f a fly box? And he said, yeah, I've got your fly box. He said, John Golding picked it up. It was under an electric fence. I knew where it was gone. You know, I hadn't closed whatever. Yeah, yeah. And um, anyway, he said, what time did you get that fish last night? I said, I don't know, 10, 15, 10, 30. You know what I mean? That yeah, yeah. type of time. And he said... Um, Last night, at the same time, he said, um, a man called Warbridge, who was fishing a mile below me, right, a mile or so below me, um, in the Sigui, had a fish of 19 pound one, he said. And those were two of the biggest fish caught on this river for years. And, and they were caught at the same time. You know, good migratory rivers are really rubbish brown trout rivers because those fish can't get to that yeah. size if they stay in that river. So they, they have to go to sea. But, you know, you know, that you, makes sense. you fish the Neath with me. There's very few brown trout in there other than the ones that the club stocked. And typically, you know, look at the Esk. It's a great salmon river, a really bad sea trout river. Well, it's a really bad sea trout river because it's a good brown trout river so though that stock either or has stayed in that river and not gone to sea and become sea trout or become a, a species that migrates from the river whereas the salmon did there are some exceptions to that you know the tyvee in the upper reaches is a really good brown trout river you know uh what's his name um kite used to go oliver down there. Kite. yeah oliver kite you know he used to love to fish the the tyvee because that's where Kite's Imperial was born, look, you know. So the, there are exceptions to the rule, but generally a good sea trout river is a really bad brown trout river. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, because that stock migrates to sea. Yeah. So uh, coming coming back to um, what you were saying about feeding and what have you, I have caught sea trout that have had winkles or uh, crustaceans in them. But they have been straight in off the tide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't done many autopsies because I, now if I, if I catch a fish, generally it just gets returned. Um, and I, I, I guess as well because sea trouts, they suppose I suppose they come the peak time is really I guess now, isn't it? J yeah, July, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or August. So there's not a great deal. Perhaps I'm wrong in saying this now. The, the fly life, like in the spring. You know, in the spring, you get hatches of everything, and all the brown trout, as they peak. Yeah. So when they come in, they're not probably thinking of feeding. No, that's right. That's right. And they, yeah. they, 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 and generally, as the season goes on, the, smi uh, the flies that hatch get smaller because it's just the way of things. At the beginning of the season, the, the flies are bigger, then they get smaller and smaller and smaller until it tapers off and there's no more flies hatching. So uh, I remember once... Um, it always, every time I see them, you know the fox gloves, yep. the purple fox gloves, like you know. Yep. I remember years ago, um, I was with Mark Morgan, and uh, he pointed out. He said, "As soon as you see these fox gloves come out, that's when the the the, 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 the good sea trout normally come into the river." He yeah. said, "Do you yeah. find that?" Yeah, three things: wild garlic, fox gloves, and a cuckoo. So you'll just choose a handful of flies when you go? I know what I'm using. 
I know what I want from my sea trout. I'm not interested in anything else. I know. I know through trial and error when the river was full of fish. These flies have been proven and trusted between us all. Do you understand, Kerry? Yeah. There's nothing new to be... There is. I don't give a shit what they put out there. I know with a score. He's the yeah. same with trout, man. I'm obsessed. I was an obsessive with angler. That. I never had one. My son, my daughter, my wife had six sons. Not one of them in sea trout season. <laughs> Am I saying lies? I postponed my wedding because the sea trout were running. And you even took it on dates with the riverbank? I married my brother's babysitter. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. We were we were fanatics, man. Yeah. My brother never worked from the age of thirty six. You give it up, <laughs> go fishing. My dad was a mad keen fisherman. Um, was he a doctor or something? Yeah, he was a doctor. Yeah. I mean, yeah. he he come back to Wales. My dad was Welsh speaking. My mum was English from Norfolk, and uh, they moved back. He ran a practice. He was the old Doctor Finlay type. Yeah, you know, he 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 would go out and see his patients. When we were kids, we very rarely saw my dad. The phone would ring. My mother was an unpaid telephonist in those days, yeah. and he'd be off to the farms in the middle of the night. But he loved fishing. Was oh, where his, was this then? Uh, Abadovi and Tawin. That's what you were yeah. brought up. Yeah, that's that where it? I was brought. Right. I was very lucky, um, and my father taught me. He was one of the best casters I've ever seen. You know, I go back now, and he he, he was cane rods wow. and as a little boy um, mum would say oh, I was one of six kids I was the eldest boy three boys and three girls and he would take me on this farm was on the uh, estuary of the Dovey high up near Dovey Junction the railway and Gwynant lovely man was the farmer there and dad could fish the tidal piece and you know the local um, club own it and New Dovey Fisheries, most of the river, was left to them, and they run it really successfully, very well. But Dad could fish this private bit. And as a little boy, we'd have to walk for half a mile along the river embankment to the Drynock Pool, or whatever it was called, I forget. And he would carry two rods, Kerry, in those days, two cane rods. One would be 10 foot, and one would be 8 foot 6. I remember that. Kingfisher lines, silk lines on the reels. Silk line, yeah. And he would wade in the lovely old black Dunlop thigh waders in those days. And he'd wade in at the tail of the pool in the evening. The tide was out, of course. And I, I can still see it. You'd see a lot of midge floating down the river. It'd be flat calm. And dimples, fish coming up all over the place, sucking them in. Would he be uh, fishing for trout then? No, this is honestly true. My father would then turn to me and he'd say, there were lots of little ditches and streams running in. So I'd go off and play in them, catching the minnows. I was bored. Uh, I didn't want to watch my dad fishing. He'd yeah. laid out. Um, and he'd have the big rod, which used to have in those days, I remember it, on the gut cast. And I think he still had, it was the start of nylon, you know, for, for casts. Um, but gut cast and kingfisher line, which had to soak in the water to sink, if you wanted it to sink. Yeah. Um, he'd have a haslam on, which was a famous dovey haslam, fly. Yeah. Do you remember it? Yeah, yeah. Well, th there were two, if my memory serves me well, um, beautiful fly. Um, it had a palmer body over silver, and I think from memory, probably a, a hen pheasant wing, or maybe a, a bronze mallard, I can't remember. Yeah. But it used to have two ibis feather slips on either two horns, basically, running down the flank each side of the wing. Yeah. And I think the female was red, two slips of red, and the male were blue slips. Right. I'll never forget them. And I say, Dad, I'll, I'll let it soak. Now, so we say, for the sake of argument, he started at 7.30 in the evening. And the tide wouldn't be in there until half eleven. So he'd fish then. And he'd go in with his little eight foot six rod. He's a very good caster. Fish delicately. Can you believe this, Kerry? 
he'd be fishing with a size 16 or 14 black panel dry. Yeah. Dry, cock hackles, stiff, yeah, yeah. right? And he'd be catching suen from half a pound up to two and a half pounds. In daylight, though. In daylight, yeah. I mean, this was when the light was going, he would then come ashore, put that rod away. Where's my rod? And I'd show it with a line pulled off the reel soaking in the stream. Yeah. Good boy. And he'd take that out. And he'd wade deeper as the light started to go. And then he may catch three or four, what we would call big suin, you know, four to six pound. Really? And he was doing this. And the best of it was, and this is what sticks in my brain, he turned to me and he'd have two hessian sacks tied up in his fishing bag. And he'd open one and drop, and he kept everything in those days, bar the small ones. He'd put 20-odd suin in the one bag, 20 small fish, right? And in the other, three or four of the bigger fish he caught later. And then he'd tie the string around the top. Or like a keep net. No, no. Oh, they were dead? Dead, oh yeah, to take home. Oh, yeah, yeah. Now, I'll tell you why. It wasn't greedy, they all did it in those days. But my dad would say, right, boy, you start dragging that bag along the river embankment towards the car. The car was half a mile away. Yeah. I was eight years old. And he'd set off with the bag with the big fish in and his fishing tackle ahead of me. And then he'd come back to find me. I was petrified. It was going dark. And I was dragging this bag with all these wow. sewing in, being bitten to death by midges. You, can, you yeah. never forget these things. No. And then <laughs> the next morning, for example, he'd be in his surgery in Abu Dhabi and they'd be in there and say, Mrs. Joe Nantiesin would be there to see him. And in Welsh now, they'd be talking together and he'd be going through her records. He'd say, you need to eat a decent diet of fish, dear. And he'd turn round to the sink in the surgery and give her two suin. And wow. he'd give them to his patients. And There'd be we, a queue every time oh the yeah, day after oh he yeah. went fishing. He, he, people used to say, did they really need to see you about medical things, Tom? <laughs> <laughs> but he did that with, with the aim of giving them fresh fish. Yeah, we, we, we had sea trout regularly. If you don't lose your flies, yeah. you won't catch fish. Yeah. And then when you're not used to a river, yeah. and then you lose a couple of flies, yeah. and you think, oh, geez, not again. You know? yeah. And then you start to get tired. Yeah. But the good thing what we did then, we stopped. Yeah. And then we had a, a brew. Yeah. And then after only half hour, yeah. this was like midnight, something like that, and you were fresh then to start again. Yeah. It's always good to stop and readjust. Yeah. And have a bit of a reflect, a reflection on what's just happened. Yeah. And what's happened so far in the evening. And sometimes by doing so, you can maybe figure something out that's. Yeah that maybe you think might work later on in the night and it's not always it's not always the way but by doing the same thing that you were doing in that certain pool earlier on in the night and there's nothing saying that that's going to work in the next pool yeah. so we might have to ring the changes and it's always good to ring the changes because no no two pools are the, are the same so structure of pools uh, totally different. So, you know, if we've, if we're having these gullies in front of us and the fish are on a drop off or something, then yeah. maybe because they are down right down in the gully, we're gonna have to then utilise sink tips. One thing I noticed as well last night, which you big difference when you were, and me, you were, you were fishing much stronger uh, nylon yeah. leader than me. Yeah. And then I did up to ten pound then, I'll probably put ten yeah. pound on again tonight. Yeah. Well I was actually only using twelve last night. Yeah. Um that's light for me. <laughs> you only use this fifteen, you said. Yeah, yeah, so I always go with the fifteen. That's what if there's a flow, I guess. Yeah, if there's a good flow and you know it's it's more of a precaution than anything, having a, a heavy diameter. Because a thicker diameter line, I mean it's 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 always there as a precaution for when Maybe you never know. It's like with sea trout fishing, you never know what the next fish is going to be. So be prepared. Yeah, yeah. And always using 15 pound line, I've always felt more confident into the fight. Yeah. Uh, so. It, you can bully them a bit more. Yeah, so like fish I've hooked this season, I've 
I've landed fish up to twelve pound this season. Wow. Using you know fifteen pound line, but it's there's so many overhanging trees and branches and snags and rocks. Yeah. You've got to bully them, haven't you? Yeah, you've got to you've got to put the brakes on them sometimes. It, it's it's like um, the fish I said last week that I lost as well in, into the roots. You know, I was putting some pressure on him, but the line never snapped. The yeah. the hooks pulled out before the line. So that was telling me, you know, it's the right thing to do. But like I explained about the the thinner diameter, it, it can play a big part in low water thinner diameter. Yeah. You know, by just dropping down maybe to 12, 10 pound, even to eight if you feel more comfortable. Um, just so, giving more movement into yeah. the fly. The rivers change constantly. The gravel beds shift, uh, banks get eroded, there are new holes here, there and everywhere. So at the start of the season, rather than me go seeking fish, I go and check the wading lines. Oh, there's a big hole there. I didn't know that was there. That must have reappeared or appeared over the winter. I'll cast a fly and watch how my line comes through the pools. And I'll get all of this intelligence, effectively, to dictate later on how I'll fish that pool. Okay? So, all of that is accumulative. The more you go the more you rec uh, your reconnaissance is done, the more you get to know what you're going to do. So come, say, June, when it's really the bread and butter uh, stuff, June, July, um, I generally have a very good picture of the river, where the fish are. I'd be speaking to other anglers, where were the fish caught, how high, how low, even... The, I'd know what the tides are doing. And I generally get there, say, midsummer, you're talking about 10, 10.30 before it goes dark. So I'd get there, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, check all my gear, have a wander up and down the river, spot fish, if I can see the fish, and then sit and wait. And just as darkness goes, the fish generally show themselves. You know, you hear the tail go, and then another fish will start, and another fish will start. And then you can mark these fish off. They, they, they're doing their little patrol, showing you where they are. Once that's done, as darkness descends, and sometimes even just on dusk, I'll have a go with small flies fished fast in that thin water. Occasionally you'll have a couple... You won't really disturb the water. Those fish are going to stay there. They're not going to move. Come out, give it a rest, and then I start on darkness. As Yeah, on darkness, that's when I'd get in, and I'd start to work my way through the pool. One of the memorable nights for me was to go to the river one night, and it was starting to rain, and it was windy. And I'll always remember, I went to fish the Hewlas there, and I, I drove up the valley a bit, there were two cars. I fished through the Hewlas, didn't catch anything, by which time it was raining, proper rain, right? West Wales rain. Right? So I come back and I think to myself, I go to fish one place, you know what I mean, see. And I went up to St. John's, and I went in and I caught one take, 14 pounder. One take. I take that. Right? Nothing else. And by which time now I was wet through. So I went back to the car and I thought, shall I fish on or not? So I drove back down the valley. I got to St. Morgan, which is close, not far from home. And I thought, shall I have a go? Well, I might as well, I'm wet, I'm whatever, and we're going to have you can't get dirty, more wet. dirty water tomorrow probably with all this rain, because it was still raining. So I went in there, and in the tail of St. Morgan, I hooked a small, three pounds of fish, right? I say small, not that small, but... And lost it landing it, because I tried to drag him up on the stones and he went back. I was quite happy, you know what I mean? It didn't bother me in the least. 
And then I thought to myself, shall I go down to Dorgalanen or not, which is around the corner, another 150, 200 yards. And I thought, oh, I'm soaked. And I was soaked, and I thought, oh, I might as well. You know what I mean? I'm not going to get any wetter than this. So I went in there, and I'll always remember that right at the beginning, and it was that first inkling of the first light of dawn, right? First inkling. It wasn't light at all. You know what I mean? It was just, you had a yeah. feeling it was coming. And I hooked a fish, and he took me around that pool, and he was a big fish, you know, big, big, big fish. And I came to land him now. I was going to beach him. And I brought him back. And by which time, the light had lifted slightly, right? Still dark, but... I brought him in, and he was lying there. I can see him now. And my dropper, he was on the point fly, got stuck in some Japanese knotweed that was growing out of the bank. You know that stuff? Yeah. And jagged it, see? And I couldn't drag him any further, right? So I reeled in came down, pulled this Japanese knotweed out of the stones, and got down to him, and he tumbled, and he went back in. And I dived in after him. I was already wet anyway, because I would have loved to have been able to see how, how much that fish weighed, because I had a weigh net. And he just, in my arms, literally went. You actually touched him? Oh, yeah, yeah, I had my arms round him. Oh, so I had partly no. round him. You know that sort of feeling? <laughs> But of course, they're quite slippery, and as you know, and and there we are. And I think I would have probably then got probably the best race best. that I would have ever had. Well, he was he was in the upper teens, yeah. but I would have had a brace, maybe thirty two, thirty three. Oh, I see, because you had done earlier, yeah. And I can remember before I caught that fish in twenty fourteen, I crossed the river. The moon was shining. Then. And I put on a muddler. And the moon was shining just under the bushes there. And I crossed the car. I thought, oh, I'll give it a little go there. And I flicked under the bush, Kerry, like that. And I thought, oh. yeah. And I started pulling this muddler back towards me. And the wake that followed this muddler, I couldn't really let. It was absolutely it was enormous, lit up by the moonlight. I couldn't pull that muddler fast enough. <laughs> back to the shore. I did not want that fish on the end of the line. Really? I was, like, I was terrified. Absolutely terrified. I was shaking. I, thought, I can't believe it. It's actually followed it from the start. I'm doing something right. <laughs> <laughs> I pulled it back as fast as I could. Blew my whistle. <laughs> Where's Andy? He's down in the bottom pipe pool now. I was like, what's wrong? What's wrong? <laughs> <laughs> But funnily enough, about a fortnight before, Andy had gone down the river and he'd come back. He said, I've never been so frightened in my life. He said, I looked down. It must have been just getting dusk. He said, I cannot explain to you the size of this fish that just went over my way, Dad. Wow. Is that before or after? That was about a fortnight before. So you didn't take? No. You, I was you, pulling it so quickly that uh, he didn't have a chance. And I was like, ah. I'd have been gutted and if I could he didn't. I see the tail turn around and go back. I was like, shaking, shaking. I, go, I can't believe it. I thought, did you see that? Where is he? Yeah, did No. Looked after five guys one night. You know, and lovely guys. We caught nothing. Get in the Jeep on the back of the, finish the night, down a row of on the bottom beat. I reversed into a tree. Yeah. Oh. Smashed the back end of my uh, Mitsubishi. You, know, the you reversed into the tree, or they did? Oh, you did. Back. I reversed into the tree, smashed the back window, which was quite funny at the time, isn't it? But, uh, Through the window? Yeah, the back window. Completely shattered, yeah. Hit the, hit the oak tree. <laughs> I, I pass that tree every day, and I think, yeah, remember that. And, uh, yeah, so we get back, you know, took them back to the digs, and uh, they gave me 500 quid in cash. Like. Did he, as a yeah, tip? Yeah, 500 quid. Whoa. So I went towards a new window, eh? Yeah, I think they, they took a funny side of that. I took a funny side of that. <laughs> so, there's one guy then, he came. Uh, we got a, you've got Paradise Flats, which goes into the gold mines, which goes into Paradise Flats. Yeah? At Whistlepool, gold mines, Paradise Flats. Yeah? Three unbelievable names for pools, yeah? Yeah. So as it was getting dark, I'd always take... If a guy, I'd always take the rod down to Paradise Flats, you know? Yeah. Uh, it's a chance before it gets dark for me to have a look 
how good the casting is, what the capabilities they are, you know, where and where, you know, how I can fish certain areas, you know what I mean? Sometimes you know, yeah, we've got a chance tonight, and other times then you've got to kind of change your tack before you start, because you know, as I said earlier, you know, the whistle pool can be quite a long cast. But this guy could fish, he was a good guy. Will, I wouldn't say second, and it's just calling Will, yeah? <laughs> and uh, we went on Paradise Flat, so I'd always fish, you know, it was a tail of a, tail of a long pool, shallow water into fast water. You know, it'd always be a good place for, for a fish as it's getting dark. You know, they come through the fast water, they tuck up on the bank. Yeah. You know, you'd, you'd watch them many a night just bow waving through. Yeah. So he's, he's, he has a fish about two or three pound. You know, so it's getting dark, so we go up to the whistle pool and then, like you fishing a secret weapon. First run down, seven and a half pounder, bar of silver, yeah? stunning fish. Nothing with this guy, blase, like, you know what I mean? Next run down, 13 and a half pounds each shot, bar of silver. You know, he's had three fish now, mint, proper silver fish. The fourth run down, you know, you're done now, like, and you're thinking, you know, this guy's made up. I think we've done another two two runs down, nothing, yeah. So he's kind of, oh, is that it, like, you know, we finished now, we? I said, well, you know, we can have a coffee on our, you know, it's done now, isn't it? So you get back to the car, again, a bit motionless, kind of, you know, there's not emo much emotion with the guy, if that's the right word. And he just turns around to me, and the last thing he said, I was open for a 15. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, you, know you, you come away, you're a bit disappointed, you know. Mm. You know, I, I think in... Some people think it's, they just see what's on ah, the magazine. Well, that's it, and, I, and, you know, and you have seen now, certainly with, say, your Trout and Salmon, you know, whereas... To get your name in Trout and Sam and say when I was 12 or 13, living on the estate, you know, you'd be a hero in school with a three pounder or a four pounder. Yeah. You know, you caught a five pounder. You know what I mean? You'd be talking that class for ever and a day. So anyway, I was sitting there on the grass and I watched my brothers cross the river, see the white water where they were crossed, and out of sight. And I was left there on my own, shivering and frightened. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, Crash! Right opposite me, but there, see? Big sea trout jumped, see? And then crash again, another one. <laughs> oh, Christ! So, anyway, <laughs> I picked my rod up and I waded in and I was trying to cast now and I put the badger on. What made me put it on? I don't know why I tied them up and I put the badger lure the on. Tandem. A tandem one, right? And it was a hell of a job to cast with it because there was a bit of wind. Now, in this very spot, in low water, normally you wouldn't fish there. It was just shallow piece, but it had a bit of a neck on it. So, I, and it used to open up, and the light used to hit it there, even on the darkest of nights. It was a sort of light, and you could see the gravel line on the other side, like, see? Yeah. And I'd be casting at this gravel, trying to get close to it, trying to get close to it, couldn't get, and working my way down, and another sewing jump close, oh, frightened the life out of me, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm pushing away, and then all of a sudden, man, oh, 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 I was into a fish. It was the first big fish that I had hooked. And you're on your own? Fright and on my own. Frightened to death. Frightened to death. Splush, splash, crash, white water everywhere. R oh, oh, tell of a job to hold on to it. Played it there for I don't know how long I played it. And I don't know many times it had gone slack and I thought I'd lost it. And I was pulling in like that. And then all of a sudden I looked up. There's a fish lying in front of me. He was lying at my feet. Uh, huge. Uh, 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 I scoop fish up onto the no bank. Net, no net to the Nothing. Net. I killed the fish and I put it down on the bloody grass bank by there, by, by the side of me. I couldn't stop looking at it. Where were your brothers? My brothers hadn't come. They were still down in the pool. Still down in the pool. I couldn't get over it. Oh, my God, that was the first big sea trout that I wow. got. How hefty he was at that time, I couldn't estimate it, right? I just knew that it was very big. If you've enjoyed listening to these trailers and want to listen to the full episodes, please consider becoming a Patreon. 
where you'll get weekly podcasts and access to over 140 episodes, behind-the-scenes photography, plus other exclusive content and prizes. To become a Patreon, visit patreon.com forward slash casting with Kerry Jones or you can find the link on my website castingwithkerryjones.com